إن أردتم أن تكونوا شامة بين الورى فاختفوا آثار جيل للمعالي سطرا إن أردتم أن تكونوا Brothers, sisters, salam alaikum. Thank you very much, first of all, for inviting me here tonight. Um, and I'm really impressed at uh, how you swung into action and, and uh, organized the event at such short notice. Um, I think you've managed it in, in just a matter of days, so uh, I'm really impressed. But let me start with my story. Now, I was tr looking around and seeing all these young faces and trying to work out how old you would have been when 9-11 happened. And you are probably about 10, 11 years old. But I bet you still remember exactly where you were, what you were doing, and who you were with when the news came through about that horrendous attack on the Twin Towers. I know where I was, I was in my newsroom in London where I was the chief reporter of the Sunday Express. I saw people gathering around various televisions in the newsroom and I said, what are you doing? They said, oh, there's been a, a terrible accident. A pilot must have had an attack, a heart attack or something and he's flown his plane into one of the towers in New York. So I stood there watching all of this happen. There's something compelling, isn't there, about breaking news live on TV. So I was watching and then the second plane came into view and it went into the second tower. Of course, we all realized in an instant what it was. And we suddenly, as journalists, swept into overdrive to make plans. I was working for a Sunday newspaper. This had happened on a, a Monday or a Tuesday. And within two hours, I had an over, um, a bag packed and I was heading off to the airport. By the time I got there, everything had closed down in America. The borders had closed. No planes were getting in and out. The, the towers were starting to implode. There was panic in the airports from Americans who lived and were heading back to New York. They were watching all these scenes. It was total chaos. I have since learned that in the Muslim community, everybody ran home and anybody living in America was told there's been a terrible attack, get home straight away, don't talk to anybody. People were afraid because they knew that a backlash would come and, and they were right. But I, as I say, was on my way to the airport. I was trying to get to New York. And by about the third or fourth day, I got the first, um, the tickets for the first flight out. And as I headed towards the departure lounge, my news editor called me and he said, there's been a change of plan, we want you to go to Pakistan. I said, why would I want to go there? And they said, that is where the next part of the story is going to unfold. I said, I'm not dressed for Pakistan, don't you need injections, is it safe for me to go? I was so culturally unaware, never had anything to do with Pakistan before. Within 24 hours, I was in Islamabad. By the end of the week, my boss was right. This was indeed where the story was happening. More than 3,000 journalists had assembled in, in uh, Pakistan, waiting for what everybody guessed would be a war breaking out. There was a war of words, certainly at that point, between Afghanistan, Pakistan, Washington, London. George Bush was demanding revenge, and uh, there was frantic talks and <coughs> we were trying to work out when the war would start, if the war would start. But working for a Sunday newspaper, we tried to be more analytical and instead of reacting to news breaks, we try and plan ahead. And I thought that the best story for me would be in Afghanistan. I went to the Taliban embassy three times and, and 
Three times I asked for a visa, three times I was refused. And then in the end, I um, spoke to one of my guides and said, you know, is there any way we can get into Afghanistan? And uh, he made some inquiries. He said, I think we can sneak you in if you wear the burqa. We'll get a couple of locals and they'll take you in. And that's what happened. And it all sounded like a good idea. You know, I would get an exclusive. Nobody else was going into Afghanistan. I would find out what life was like for ordinary Afghan people. And so we set off. I put on this burqa, which was brilliant. It was like Harry Potter's magic cape. You know, as soon as I put it on, I people just ignored me. Nobody bothered me. Um, I felt as though I was invisible, but I could see the world through this grill. We descended into this dust bowl known as Tolkien, and um, there was all sorts of activity going on there. And then we started to walk across no man's land to the Afghan side of the border, and there were some Taliban soldiers, great big black turbans and big black beards. I was to find out later that the more pious an individual, the bigger his turban would be. But I didn't realize that. Uh, but there were, there were these big black turbans and, um, and big black beards. And as I started to walk across no man's land, I'm beginning to think, you know what, maybe this isn't such a good idea after all. And I could hear my heart thumping in my ears, and I'm thinking they'll pick up on my fear, they'll hear my heart racing, but they took no notice of me. I was um, across on a piece of paper that uh, my two guides from the tribal areas handed in, and off I went, and, and there I was in Afghanistan with the two guides, and we went to the nearest town, which was Jalalabad. They wanted to buy some food, some provisions for their relatives in another village that we were going to visit. And so I sat on the edge of uh, this marketplace and just watched life unfold. And of course, I had been told that the Taliban were brutal, were evil, they hated women, um, the women were just uh, not represented in their society. And as I watched and looked around, I noticed that all the shopping was being done by men. And I thought, actually, this is quite liberating, isn't it? You know, you, can you imagine um, getting men to do the shopping in Britain? You know, nobody likes to. And here, all these men were doing the shopping, they were doing the trading, the negotiating. And of course, in Afghanistan, where Women aren't allowed to talk to men other than a, um, than a father, an uncle, um, a husband, somebody close to them, you know, that there's no communication allowed. Um, it would, was impossible in many ways for a woman to do the shopping um, because she wouldn't know who the trader was. But anyway, I still like the idea of, of the men doing the grocery shopping and, and uh, I thought it was quite uh, quite a, a nice idea. And then I'm looking at the faces, and this, everybody has beards and, and Kalashnikovs, and, but they're laughing and they're joking, and I'm thinking they're about to be bombed by the, the biggest superpower in the world, and they don't look scared at all. You know, what, what's going on here? You go on to the Pakistan side of things, and people are panicking, they're moving things out. But there was a very light, jovial atmosphere in this uh, place. Then we got our provisions, we went off to this village, we had to walk across um, some fields, and there was great joy when uh, these two men arrived because um, one of them was related to somebody in the village, and so there was almost a party atmosphere, and, and they were delighted to see all this food, and then they obviously must have said, you know, who, who's the woman that you brought with you? And when they said, she's a Western journalist and she wants to see what life is like in Afghanistan, they were horrified. They, they apparently had said, what on earth have you brought her in here for? Mula Omar has just made this edict that anyone helping a Westerner will be killed. 
and you're bringing this woman in here. And so I was taken into this house and there was lots of loud shouting and, and one of my guides said, they're not happy that you're here, just sit and, and be quiet in this room while we try and work something out. But within half an hour, the curiosity of the Afghan people in this village, um, together with their amazing hospitality, just came through and they offered me food. And then this uh, young girl who must have been in her early 20s, she said to me through the translator, um, I'm very sad that I am stuck in this village. I should be training to be a doctor, but I'm just rotting away. I was sent home last year. And I said, oh yes, I understand that the Taliban don't want to educate women. And then her brother said, no, this isn't the case because I was also training to be a doctor with my sister. But he said the money ran out and uh, the school closed down and now we're both sitting in this house and, and we should be saving lives and, and we're stuck here. And I really felt for them, I felt their frustrations. And then this woman came in, larger than life, and she looked me up and down very slowly and her toes started tapping and she put her hands on her hips. The sisters know this is a sure sign of trouble, not a word is spoken, it's just the body language. And then she finally broke her silence and she said, do you have any children? And I said, yes, I have a daughter. And I was very eager to engage with this woman. And I said, yes, I have a daughter. And she said, uh, just one. And I said, yes, um, I have one child. And she laughed and she said, you English and American women, you are all so pathetic. All you can ever manage is one, maybe two. Me, I can have 15. And when you run out of your boy soldiers, I will be providing more. And I thought, wow, you know, I thought that the Afghan woman was supposed to be shy, uh, subjugated, oppressed, not a word to say for herself, and yet this woman was very outspoken. And I said to her, aren't you afraid of the Americans? You know, they're about to come to war with your country. And she said, dare one American come into my village and I myself will fight him off with those pots and pans over there. And I thought she probably would. <coughs> and then she said, but you know, we're very sorry about what happened. And you know, this, uh, this mishap that happened to the American people, we're really sad about it. And the translator kept using this word mishap. And I said, how can you call the hitting of the Twin Towers a mishap. You know, how, how can she not talk about this horrendous event and she just dismisses it as a mishap? And of course the reality is that there was no TV. They didn't see the images we saw day in, day out, on the hour, every hour, bombarded with these images of the towers being hit the towers imploding, people throwing themselves off buildings, people running for their lives. They didn't see this. They didn't really understand the full scale of the disaster. They just heard that this thing had happened in America and a lot of people died. But she said, you know, we're very sorry that this has happened, but what's it got to do with us? And I thought, because information came out very quickly in the, those first few days of 9-11, and I thought, what has it got to do with the Afghan people? There weren't any Afghans on those planes, not in the, the hijacking teams anyway. They were all Arabs. 15 or 16 of them were Saudis. The rest came from the Gulf. What did it have to do with, um, with the Afghans? And she said, you know, we're very sad, but if the Americans come, they will not be welcome if they come with their arms, and we will fight. This conversation continued, but it was quite obvious that people were getting more nervous the longer I was there. And so we left and headed back towards the border. By the time we got there, it was sealed, so we stayed overnight in a hotel and tried again the next morning and it was still sealed. 
uh, Pervez Musharraf, uh, the leader of Pakistan, had ordered that the border be sealed. So I was starting to panic because I knew that if I didn't get back in, at, at a certain time and let my news editor know that I was safe, he would raise the alarm. So I said to the guides, you know, we have to try and find another way. And they said, we can go through a smuggling route. And I thought, that sounds exciting. You know, we'll be ducking and diving from tree to tree and from cliff to cliff. And it'll be really exciting and it'll give me more to write about. So we went off on foot through this smuggling route. Two hours later, my feet are cut and blistered with the Afghan shoes I was wearing. And I said, I can't go on much further, you know, how, how far have we got to walk? And it was, well, about another few miles, and this few miles, was, it was going on and on. And also, the smuggling route wasn't dramatic or scary or, you know, there was no adrenaline there. It was uh, as busy as Piccadilly Circus. There were people coming and going. There were families with their handcarts and all their possessions fleeing towards the Pakistan border. There were young men coming from the Pakistan border saying they wanted to fight the Taliban, the great Satan, uh, they wanted to fight the Americans, the great Satan, they wanted to join the Taliban. And there was donkey traders, camel traders, people selling all sorts. So it, it was like a bazaar rather than a smuggling route. Anyway, one of my guides, said, um, look, if you're really this tired, we can get a donkey. And he took me to this string of mangy looking donkeys. And he said to me, can you ride a donkey? I said, can I ride a donkey? I ride horses, I jump fences, I gallop. I said, look at these, they're half the size. I said, of course I can ride a donkey. <laughs> you know, look at them, same shape. And so he did a deal and um, I got onto the back of this donkey, and as soon as I'm trying to adjust myself, the animal just shot off. And I'm screaming, I can't control it, people are scattering left and right to get out of the way of this runaway donkey. And as I'm trying to lean forward to pull the reins just to make it stop, the one piece of equipment that I'd taken into Afghanistan, a camera, slipped out of the folds of my burqa right in the passing view of a Taliban soldier. He saw it and he shouted. Now in truth, I can't remember whether he just stopped the donkey and pulled me off, or whether the donkey just screeched to a halt and threw me off. All I remember was going up in the air, crashing down. And as I picked myself up, I'm looking through the grill of the burger, straight into the eyes of this Afghan soldier. When I got back to London, my friends were saying, what was going through your mind when you realized you'd been caught? And I said, well, strangely enough, for a nanosecond, and it was a nanosecond, I'm looking through the grill of the burger at this man, and I just thought, my goodness, you are gorgeous. <laughs> he had the most amazing green eyes, those famous eyes. Uh, bright green that um, were on a dramatic cover of, um, of a magazine uh, a few years ago. And he had high cheekbones, a wild mane of hair, a beard with a life of its own. But as I say, it was just for a nanosecond. And then I thought, I'm in trouble. And so I handed my camera over and I closed my eyes, waiting to be shot because I believed that, you know, this was the most evil, brutal regime in the world. That's what George Bush and Tony Blair told us, and they wouldn't lie, would they? So I'm standing there with my eyes shut, <coughs> waiting to be shot. And after 10 seconds, and try it at home, it, it, it's a long time to stand there with your eyes shut. And I opened my eyes, and he'd gone. He'd gone to see the donkey trader. He wanted to know who's in charge of that woman and then I'll get hold of the real villain of uh, this camera. And I thought, I can get away. I can join another group. I'm still wearing this invisible cloak. Nobody knows who I am. So I joined another group and I'm walking along 
following behind another woman wearing a burqa. And I looked back to see what was happening, and there the soldier had pulled aside one of my guides, and he's waving the camera in his face. And then the other guide came to try and calm the situation down, and he got slapped across his face. And I walked on again thinking, well, we all agreed. If things went pear-shaped, none of us know each other, and it's every man or woman for themselves. So I continued walking. And then I looked back again. And by this time, there was a crowd of about 100 men around my guides. And I thought, I can't leave them. So I walked back. And as I walked through this crowd of men, I was thrown back. This was man's business, it had nothing to do with a woman. You know, what are you doing here? It's sort of, I was pushed back. And every time I tried to get through, I was thrown back. So in the end, I pulled off my burqa. I was wearing a shallower chemise underneath, but I pulled off my burqa and I said, will somebody let me through? And suddenly, everybody went silent. You could have heard a pin drop. And there was this parting, and these men just stood by and looked on incredulously as this Westerner walked forward towards the soldier, who by this time had his jaw wide open and thinking, what is this, where did she come from? And as I walked towards him, I thought, you know, my guides will think, what a courageous, noble woman, and I threw them a quick glance, and they looked back at me as if to say, Lady, we were in trouble before. Now we're in serious trouble. So it wasn't such a, a clever idea. So I went to the soldier, demanded he return my camera, and um, of course, uh, I was bundled into a car along with the two guides. And as we were driven off, it took about um, half an hour to get back into Jalalabad. And although there were no telephones and, and not very many mobile phones, word just zoomed around the area that the Taliban had caught an American spy. So every checkpoint we were at, they came running to the car, shouting, death to Amrika, death to Amrika, and uh, uh, Osama Zindabad and you know, long live Mr. Bin Laden and they were shouting this at me and I wound the window down at one checkpoint and said don't worry I'm not an American, no America I'm British and they looked at me as if to say what difference does that make <laughs> at another checkpoint a little boy maybe 10 or 11 came running up to the car and smacked his face right in at the window washing his nose to have a look at the American spy. And he looked so serious. And I looked at him and I smiled at him and I winked at him and he pulled his head back and shook it gravely and went like that. And I thought, yes, he's probably right. I was um, taken into the intelligence headquarters of Jalalabad and was given some paper and a pen and told to write down my name, write down my details, prove I was who I said I was. And, uh, and after I did that, I said, um, you know, can I use your telephone? And they said no. Um, and then they said, uh, we, um, you will be here as our guest. And would you like some food? And I said, if you don't let me use the telephone, and speak to my mother, she'll be so worried about me. If you don't let me use the telephone, I'm not eating your food as a guest or a prisoner of the Taliban. Now you would think that the most evil, brutal regime in the world couldn't care less whether I ate their food or not, but this really upset them. They took me to a room. It was um, a very simple room with a lovely Afghan rug. They had a, an air conditioning unit in there. Um, there were some bars on the window, and um, every morning, noon, and night, they would come in and they would offer me food. And each time I would say, telephone, and they would go, no. And I'd say, take the food away. 
The third day, they were so upset at this, they brought out the chef, for want of a better description. And this ragged little man came in with one big black tooth in the middle of his mouth. And they said, tell this man why you won't eat his food. And he's looking at me. And this great big tear rolled down his leather brown skin. And he's pleading in uh, Pashtu that I should eat his food. And I thought, what is going on here? These people are supposed to be evil and brutal and he's crying because I'm not eating his food. <laughs> then the doctor came. The doctor spoke a little bit of English. He trained in Germany and he took my pulse, he took my blood pressure, he took my temperature and, um, and then he took my blood pressure again and I thought, yes, I have high blood pressure, and it's probably through the roof. And um, something was bothering him, and I said, I have high blood pressure. He said, your blood pressure is normal. I said, it can't be normal. I have high blood pressure. He said, your blood pressure is normal. And he showed me the monitor and, and took my blood pressure again. And I said, well, there you go. Three days of the Taliban, and you've cured my blood pressure. Thank you very much. And then I thought, I know why he's doing all these health checks. They do it in Texas, don't they, on death row when they want to execute somebody. For some bizarre reason, the doctors call to make sure they're fit and well and able to be executed. And I thought, that's what they're doing here. They're, he's checking to see that I'm fit enough to be shot or what are they going to do with me? So the doctor went the next day the translator um, called Hamid came running in. You're famous, you're famous. And he was waving the local Jalalabad newspaper. And there was a little story and headlines which went right down the page. And I said, what does the headline say? And he said, the headline says, the Taliban have cured Yvonne Ridley's blood pressure and she's very happy. <laughs> <laughs> Not something you'd read in the sun, but you know, that was, um, that was their, their headline. The so-called interrogations would um, happen uh, every day, uh, and, and I'd be, the, the first few days I was asked the same questions time and time again. Uh, give us your name, who is your father, who is your father's father? And uh, I think it was again on the third or fourth day, one of the men noticed that I kept putting my father's father down as Mr. Ridley, and my father down as Alan Ridley. And uh, one of them said, uh, your father's father, Mr. Ridley. And I went, yes. And they said, what is his first name? I didn't know. My grandfather on my father's side must have done something very bad in the family because all he was ever referred to was Old Man Ridley. I never knew him. He was um, dead before I was born. And nobody talked about him and nobody talked about this terrible thing that he must have done in the family. So I had no idea. Even now, we don't talk about Old Man Ridley. But I thought, I don't want to go into, <laughs> into this detail with them. And so they said, what is your father's father? What is his first name? And I said, I don't know. And I was, oh, she doesn't know her father's father. What sort of woman is he? And you could see they were absolutely appalled. You know, what sort of woman can she be when she doesn't know her father's father? And I said, but I know my uncles. I have 12 uncles and I can name them. They said, name them, write them down. And they were very happy that at least I knew my uncle's names. On the fifth day, they came in and they never looked at me. They never looked me in the face. They would look at the ceiling, they would look at the floor, they would look at the wall. They looked everywhere but at my face. And I thought, this is a sure sign that they're going to kill me. They're so guilty that they know I'm going to die. They can't even look me in the face. Of course, in my Western arrogance and ignorance, I was too dumb to realize that they were actually showing me great respect by not looking at me in the face. 
So I misinterpreted that uh, immediately. And uh, they came in this day and they said, you have lied to us. And I said, everything I have told you is the truth. It's easy to tell the truth. It's always there. It's a constant. You don't have to make things up. It's, the, it's there. You know, I've told you the truth. And they said, you didn't tell us that you had a daughter. And I said, but you never asked me if I had a daughter. But you said you weren't married. And I said, well, I'm not married. And one of them said, how can you have a daughter if you're not married? And I just thought of all these estates in Britain where there are loads of single mums and a thumb. So anyway, I said, have you got the concept of divorce in your society? And they nodded and I said, um, I am divorced and um, my daughter's father lives there and I live there, but you know, we get on fine. And another one said, why didn't you remarry? I said, well, I have my own house, I have my own car, I have my own money, I have my own job. Why would I want to get married again? <gasps> they all got up and walked out. They were so appalled. At, um, and you could see it in their faces. These Western women are worse than we could have imagined. Horrible, <laughs> terrible. I mean, they were laughing, but I genuinely thought that I would be killed by these people. I really had fallen into the propaganda trap. And one of the propaganda things that Tony Blair had said was these people are so evil, they don't even allow their children to fly kites. And during one so-called interrogation, I asked them, I said, why don't you let your children fly kites? You know, what is, why don't, you people have fun. You know, what's wrong with flying a kite? And they looked and said, people can fly kites in Afghanistan. What we have stopped are people flying kites in towns and cities because they get their kites wrapped around power cables and they pull them and they get electrocuted and they die and, and the cables come down and then we're without electricity for two or three days until we get it fixed. And I said, look, I have flown kites before and you don't get electrocuted with paper and string. And they said, that is the way you fly kites in the West. In Afghanistan, it is a competition. The kites have a wire. They're wrapped in powdered glass. The whole point of flying a kite in Afghanistan is to try and chop down your opponent's kite so that the last kite left is the winner. And if you get a kite with powdered glass and an electric, uh, a, a, a wire inside, cutting through an electric cable, you will be electrocuted. And I thought about this. And I thought, I wonder how far I would get up Oxford Street flying a kite, especially when the Christmas decorations are around. I'd be arrested. But you see how a little bit of fact was taken, twisted, and thrown to the West. This is how miserable these people are. They won't even let children fly kites. And then I thought, actually, you could do that in Britain. You could do films and go around every housing estate and show no ball games, no ball games, uh, skateboarding band, no ball games, no ball games, and say, Tony Blair is so evil, he won't even let children kick a ball. Which would actually explain the shocking state of our football teams, but never mind. Um, so you can see how propaganda is, uh, so I had a lot of time to think about things like that, but I was still convinced that these people were going to kill me. Now on the grounds that you don't kiss the hand that slaps you, I thought, why should I be nice to these people? If I'm nice, they're still going to kill me, so I may as well be rude to them. So I, it wasn't really a strategy. I, I was just the prisoner from hell, and, and I um, spat at them, I swore at them. The hunger strike really upset them. 
And they must have gone away each time thinking, these women are worse than that we could have imagined. But each time I was aggressive or sharp or nasty or rude, they would say to me, why are you being like this? You're our guest. We want you to be happy. And I felt like saying, why are you being like this? Because I know you're brutal and evil and you're going to kill me, so why pretend? You know, let's get the gloves off and, and just be honest here. On the sixth day, Hamid came to see me. He said, you have a very special visitor. Please, please, Madam Ridley, please be respectful. I said, well, who is it? He's a very special person. I said, is it Muller Omar? And I thought, maybe it's OBL, you know. Who is this special person? He's saying, please, just be very respectful. So about 15 minutes later, there was a knock on the door. And although I was the prisoner, I had the key. So I unlocked the door. <laughs> this was not Guantanamo. So I, so I unlocked the door. And there in front of me was a man that made my blood run cold. The hair on the back of my neck stood up. I had avoided talking about religion for six days. And there in front of me was an imam. And I just thought, oh boy, I'm in serious trouble now. This is the one who's going to do whatever Muslims do and I'll lose my head. And unlike the Taliban, who had these massive big black turbans and big black beards, this man had a rather modest light brown beard and an ivory turban and an ivory cloak. His clothes went right to the ground. You couldn't see his feet. The Taliban, <coughs> everything that they wore was from the ankles up. This man just was covered in, in this ivory cloak. And there was something else about it, something really weird that I had never seen before. I have seen since, but I've never seen it before. He had a light on his face, but the light wasn't shining on him. It was shining out of him. I now know that to be the Noor. And I have seen it on people's face since, but never to this degree and intensity. And I'm thinking, what's he got on his face? What is it, you know, is it makeup? What is it? What's making his face light up like this? And, and he, he was almost, uh, you know, illuminating. And I stood back and let him in, and he swept in very elegantly and sat down, and I went trotting in after he sat down, and Hamid, the translator, was there. And he said, what religion are you? And I thought, oh, here we go. I said, I'm a Christian. He said, yes, but what sort of Christian? Are you a Roman Catholic? Are you a Protestant? I said, I'm a Protestant from the Church of England. And he said, and what do you think of Islam? And I thought, and I just thought, well, I mean, I knew very little about Islam. And what I did know, you could write on the back of a stamp. And that turned out to be wholly incorrect. And he said, so, what do you think of Islam? And I thought, and I said, oh, it's wonderful, absolutely wonderful. And I then went off in praise of this faith that I knew very little about. And he smiled serenely. And he said, Islam is a beautiful religion. <gasps> I couldn't agree more. <laughs> I couldn't agree more. Everybody here, you know, they, they, uh, they pray. I said, do you know, they pray four or five times a day. I've been counting them. And of course, I <laughs> didn't realize that the five prayers were obligatory. So he must have thought you stupid woman, but he was far too polite to say that. And he said, yes. Islam is beautiful, so you would like to convert? <gasps> I thought he's trapped me. He's deliberately set a trap for me. If I say, yes, I'll convert, and I'll sign on the dotted line, give me the funny hat or whatever it is I need to wear, and I'll sign. And then I thought, if I say that, he'll think I'm very insincere and fickle. And 
he'll say, take her away and have her stoned. And then I thought, but if I say no, I don't want to be part of you weird religion and, and uh, I'm not interested in Islam. He'll, he'll still say, take her away and have her stoned. So I'm sitting there and I said, look, um, I'm very flattered that you would invite me to join your religion. However, I can't make such a life-changing decision while I'm in prison. But if you let me go, I promise that when I get back to London, I will read your holy book and read up on Islam. And uh, if you let me go, you know, that, that's what I do. I give you my word. And he smiled and he didn't say anything more and he got up and he glided out. And Hamid came back a few minutes later and he said, you're going, you're going home on a red crescent plane. Well, I punched the air and congratulated myself for having been so clever in the way that I dealt with this imam. And um, half an hour later, I was on a truck bound for Kabul. But we didn't go to the airport. Instead, we went to what I can only describe as one of the grimmest third world prisons that your imagination could conjure up. But I thought, well, I know there are other Westerners here, so we're probably collecting them and we're probably all going home on a red crescent plane. So I was taken into this prison, taken down this dark corridor, and then this cell door was thrown open. And one of the guards said, this is for you. And I said, I'm not staying in there. I said, I'm not, I, I'm going home on a red crescent plane. You've got this all wrong. I said, now get me to the airport. He said, you are a bad woman. You came to our country with no passport, with no visa. You have to be punished. And I said, I'm not going in there. And we had this row and I was shouting and screaming at them. And they wouldn't touch me. They kept inviting me to go into the cell. If it had been Holloway, I probably would have been beaten with a rubber truncheon and thrown in. Just then, another cell door opened and six women wearing hijabs came out. And one of them said to me in an Australian voice, are you from the Red Crescent? I said, no, I'm not. I said, um, I'm a journalist, and I said, he's trying to make me go in this prison, and I said, I'm not going in. I said, look at the state of it. And she, and then I said, hang on a minute, I said, you speak English. She said, I'm Australian, these two are Americans, and these three are Germans. I went, oh my goodness, you're the Christians who've been trying to convert Muslims to Christianity. I said, I've read about you, and... We got talking and they said, look, stay in our cell tonight and we'll sort this out in the morning. They spoke the language and spoke to the guards. And I think the guards were just so relieved to get me off their hands that they agreed. And I thought, well, if I ever get out of this hellhole, then I've got an even better story to write because, you know, I've got these six Western women to write about as well. So I went with them into the cell and I walked into this concrete box <coughs> with bars on the window and some rickety beds and I just started to cry and the tears just flooded down and I said well the Taliban have finally broken me I'm deeper into Afghanistan than ever before and I'm just never going to get out and this place is terrible and like any nicotine addict in a crisis, I reached for my cigarettes. Although I was on hunger strike, I was still smoking, and the Taliban were very happy to give me a box of 200, which I thought was quite generous. So I got a cigarette out, and I'm about to light up. And as a courtesy, I just said, oh, does anybody mind if I smoke? And I'm about to light up, and they all said, yes, we do. This is a no-smoking cell. I thought, how do I get into the only no-smoking cell in Asia? And what sort of Christians are they? They can see how upset I am. They said, if you have to smoke, you can go outside. And so I said, okay. So I went to walk to the door. And one of them said, we're about to have a meeting. And I said, a meeting? And they said, yes, uh, we have two meetings a day. And I'm looking around, thinking, 
What do they talk about twice a day? Have you seen The Great Escape? I thought, this is the, the, the escape committee, and I'm looking for the tunnel, for the, the stove that moves to one side. I thought, this is what they're discussing. So I said, do you mind if I sit in and listen? And they said, no, not at all. So I sat on the edge of the bed with my matches and cigarettes. And they all sat round in a circle on the concrete floor and pulled out Bibles. And one of them started reading very loudly from the Bible. And I just thought, I don't believe this. These women have been charged with trying to convert Muslims to Christianity. And they're reading from the Bible very loudly. Any minute now, those Taliban are going to come running in with those whips and we'll all get battered and it'll be collective responsibility. And I'm sitting there with white knuckles thinking, oh my goodness, you know, and 20 minutes later, they're still reading from the Bible and nobody had come in. Of course, what I was to discover later is that as Muslims, we allow people of the book, i.e. Jews and Christians, to read and conduct their own faith. And that is exactly what the Taliban were doing. Again, something that uh, brothers have had very difficult experiences with in Guantanamo. So, after they'd finished, they then pulled out pieces of paper that they'd handwritten, and they started singing. Now then, I had been a Christian, I was a practicing Christian, I'd gone to church, you know, maybe twice a month, which, let's face it, in Britain, is bordering on fanaticism. And, um, and this wasn't the sort of somber Victorian hymns that I was used to. This was full-on, happy-clappy, evangelical, style singing, hallelujah, praise the Lord, and all of that, and I just thought, right, time for a smoke. So I went out into the courtyard, and I'm standing there having a cigarette while they're still, hallelujah, and all of this, and then the azan started, and I thought, I don't believe this. I've got this on that side of the wall five times a day, and I've got these on the inside twice a day, and by this time they're now in prayer, but again it wasn't quiet, contemplative prayer that I was used to. They were all shouting different things, and um, you know, Jesus, Lord Jesus, show us the way out of here, give us the, and all of this. And I just thought, my family will imagine I'm being tortured, and indeed I am if I've got to listen to all of this going on, you know, five times that way, twice this way. I make fun of them, but actually, their faith got them through their ordeal, which lasted much longer than mine. I was still on hunger strike, which was still annoying and upsetting the Taliban, and the prison governor came to see me. And uh, it was uh, my second day, and I'd done some washing, and one of the German girls had given me a new set of clothes and my washing was hanging up. And the prison governor, he had the biggest black turban I have ever seen. So big, I thought if he tips one way or another, he'll go over. <laughs> but you know, martial law, I've been told since, it's a sign of piety, so. He came in and he said to me, you have to remove your washing. I said, this is the female wing of the prison. This is my washing. It's drying in the sun. He said, you have to remove it. I said, I'm not removing it. He said, cover, cover. And I looked again and I said, you foolish man, you've obviously never done the washing in your life. If I cover it, it will never dry. So he started to tremble at this stage and he said, remove, and he threw his head dramatically in one direction and went like that. And I followed the line of his finger and what it was, he was referring to my underwear. And I looked and um, I said, this is my washing, I'm not removing anything. If you don't like it, you remove it. 
I thought he was going to self-emoliate. And he spun around and went raging off. Fifteen minutes later, I kid you not, he returned with the foreign minister of Afghanistan. Their version of William Hague or Colin Powell or Condoleezza Rice, Mr. McQuattle. And he came in and he said to me, you have to remove your washing. I said, this is the female wing of the prison. This is the female washing line. If you two clear off now, no man is going to look at my laundry. And he said, you don't understand. Above the female wing of the prison is the sleeping quarters of the soldiers. And if the Taliban look out and see those items, they will have impure thoughts. And I'm looking. And I just couldn't understand. You know, this is the foreign minister of Afghanistan. And he should be involved in international shuttle diplomacy, running from Washington to Islamabad to London to trying to stop a war. And instead, he's embroiled in a row over my laundry on the washing line. And I said, there's an easy solution to this. He said, I knew you were a reasonable woman. I said, tell your soldiers not to look out of the window for the next hour. He said, that's impossible. Well, the argument continued. The clothes dried long before we finished. And I thought, America doesn't need to bomb these people. All it needs to do is fly in a regiment of women soldiers waving their underwear and they'll just run off. I couldn't believe that this was focusing their mind far, far more than this uh, impending war with Afghanistan. But the next day, Mr. McQuattle returned and he said, uh, we need a few more questions to ask you and then, um, inshallah, you will go home, inshallah. I said, what is this inshallah you put on the end of every sentence? Because it never happens. Of course, now I know. And uh, I said, no, I'm finished answering your questions. I've said enough. I don't have anything more to add. I'm not a spy. If you think I am, take me away and shoot me. I really couldn't care less. Do with me what you want. I don't care anymore. And he said, we just need to ask a few more questions. And I said, no. I'm finished with the questions. I'm finished with you. I think actually I was cracking up. I couldn't, um, God forbid any of you ever get locked up, but it's losing the, the control of your liberty that uh, it, it really played with me. So I was very, very rude to this man. And to emphasize that I wasn't going to cooperate at all, I did something I've never done before, and God forbid I ever do again, but I just turned around and I spat at him. And uh, I walked away, and one of the female prison officers came and said afterwards in uh, Pashto to the American girls, tell the English woman she is going to be flogged for being so disrespectful to one of our high-ranking people. So, I'm standing there thinking, this is it, I'm, I'm going to be taken away now and, and executed for spitting at the foreign minister. About half an hour later, the gates to the prison opened and one of the American girls, Heather, said, oh my goodness, it's the Taliban, they're, they're, they're coming to take Yvonne away, they're going to flog her. And three of the Christians then dropped down at my feet, got hold of my clothes and started praying. And I'm thinking, you know, I'm feeling a bit scared at the moment and you're not helping me at all. Just then the prison door swung open and a man who I nicknamed the smiling assassin, Mr. McQuattle's assistant, came striding in. 
and he had in his hand, not a whip, but he had in his hand the one thing that I had wanted, the one thing that I'd gone on hunger strike for. He had in his hand a satellite telephone. And he strided around the room and he said in good English to everybody, today you can all ring home. You can ring your mothers, you can ring your fathers, you can ring your sisters and your brothers. You can ring your friends. You can ring anybody you want. Today, this is our gift to you. Everybody can ring home. Everybody, apart from her, the English woman, she's very bad. She spat at our minister and she has to be punished. And so this is how the most evil, brutal regime in the world punished me. I had to sit there. And with mixed emotions, because I was happy for my cellmates who would not been in touch with any family since they'd been arrested in the August, I had to sit there and watch as each of them made phone calls home. And the tears and the joy. And then one of the German girls went up to the smiling assassin and said, please let him all use the phone. It's her daughter's birthday, and it would be so kind of you if you could just show some compassion. He said, we can't do that. She's an awful woman. She really did spit at the minister. She has to be punished. And then he took the phone and looked and just walked out. But that is how uh, the most evil, brutal regime in the world punished me. Later that day, I was removed from the cell and taken upstairs, and I thought, this is it, I'm going to be executed. And I was taken to this room at the end, and again given the key. This was the sleeping quarters, and one of the senior officers um, had moved out of his room to allow me to stay there, and I was told, tomorrow you are going home, inshallah. And I thought, yes, yes, inshallah. And uh, that night, the war started. And from the position of the room that I was in, I watched the bombs dropped. I felt the terror of war. These cruise missiles were dropping within half a mile of the prison. You can hear a cruise missile from more than 20 miles away. It was a terrifying, terrifying experience. And as naive as it seems, because I had covered wars and conflicts before, as naive as it seems, I sat there thinking for the first time, bombs don't discriminate. They don't discriminate between men, women, and children, between nationalities, between uniforms and civilians. I am going to be blown to smithereens by Britain. You know, what an epitaph. And I promised to myself, if I get out of this place, I'm going to join a peace or an anti-war movement. Little did I know that at that precise time, the anti-war movement in Britain was being formed, and I was to become one of the, um, the members of uh, the Stop the War Coalition. So. I, as the bombs were dropping, I thought, well, there is no way now that the Taliban are going to release me. You know, their people are being killed, civilians are being killed. <laughs> they, they're going to kill me. The next morning, Mr. McWattle came, and he said that there was a people carrier and that I was to go home. I didn't believe him at first, and I wouldn't open the door until they convinced me. And in the end, I left. They drove me back down, past Jalalabad, back down to Torquem. And as they stopped the car, I was told, you are free. Even then, I didn't trust them. As I got out of the people carrier, I got out backwards. <laughs> because I just thought, as I go for freedom, they're going to shoot me in the back. So I got out backwards and I sort of walked backwards like this and then I turned towards Pakistan to across no man's land. And as I was crossing no man's land, the Pakistan media were shouting, how are you? How are you treated? 
How did the Taliban treat you? And as I was walking towards them, I thought about it. And I thought they treated me with courtesy and respect. And then I thought, but how did I treat them? And I thought, gosh, you know, I, I was so bad. And I would have turned around and gone back and said, look, I'm really sorry for my bad behavior, but I swear if I had turned around and I walked towards them again, I think they would have shot me. I think, I don't know who was happier to see me cross over, them or me. It was um, one of those. So when I did get over to the media, and I told them that I was treated with courtesy and respect. They didn't want to hear this. They wanted to hear about uh, brutalization, being beaten up, being burnt with cigarettes, being um, hit with rubber hoses, being electrocuted. All the things that happened later in Abu Ghraib and Guantanamo and, and Bagram, all of those things, everybody wanted to hear. And I said, sorry, you know, they treated me with courtesy and respect. When I got home, I thought about what had happened. And I thought, how as a journalist can I report with any accuracy on the Muslim world if I don't know anything about their faith? Because having seen the Taliban close up, it was quite obvious to me that being a Muslim wasn't something you pick up on a Friday and put down again after Friday prayers. It is the way you eat, the way you sleep, the way you breathe, the way you conduct yourself, the way you dress. And I just thought, how, how can I report with any accuracy if I don't know these people's way of life? And I did make a promise. And, you know, call me old-fashioned, but I think if you give your word to something, you should do your best to keep it, regardless of what the circumstances were when you made a promise. So I started reading the Holy Quran. And I was given a copy with an index in it, an English translation by Ayya Safali. And I'm looking for the chapters on how to subjugate your women, how to beat your wife, how to, and I can't find any of, of this. And, but I did find lots of um, passages which made it quite clear that the role of women in Islam is as high as men, that the regard of women in Islam is as high as men, that women are equal in spirituality, education and work. And this just blew me away. So I started reading additional literature and then I began to realize that everything that was in the Bible was in the Holy Quran. All the prophets, peace be upon all of them, they were all there, with the exception of the prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. And I started reading about him, but I read books by Karen Armstrong, Martin Ings, and non-Muslims, because I just thought, pointless, reading a book about um, the Prophet Muhammad, please be upon him, that's been written by a Muslim because obviously he'll say something nice. Um, I want to read something more critical. What I read was the most, as you know, the most amazing man who walked the earth, just an incredibly perfect human being a man who was a great supporter of women for all our weaknesses as well as our strengths. And slowly I began to realize that uh, the difference between the Bible and the Quran is the Bible is a beautiful book. It's written by men of God. But the Holy Quran is the word of God. And nobody, nobody would be that reckless to meddle with the Word of God. I can understand why the Bible is a whole raft of contradictions and different stories and, and, and not entirely accurate in places and has been open to interpretation leading to many different translations and versions of the Bible. The New Testament 
wasn't written until 70 years after the death of Jesus. Now I know, as a journalist, we can't get our facts right 12 hours after an event. You know, you go to a fire, you say 50 firefighters, somebody will say half a dozen, somebody will say 20. You, you know, there's just many different versions. And this is the same in the Bible, but there is only one Holy Quran. And my belief is that uh, the latest Quran to come off the printing presses is identical to the first one, which took 23 years to compile, and was, when it was finally compiled, was entrusted into the care of a woman. So, all of this led me to believe that uh, Christianity is a, is a great springboard to Islam and that Islam is the final message. So two years after my horrendous experience in Afghanistan, I embraced Islam and joined what I consider to be the biggest and the best family in the world. I have been back to Afghanistan many times. And a few months ago, I met with Mullah uh, Zaif, who was the Taliban ambassador um, in Pakistan, he had announced to the world that I was being released because my mother said to me, she said it was so embarrassing, I had all these journalists and the Sky News team in my lounge and we were all waiting for this announcement and this poor man stood up and said, we are releasing the English woman. She's a very bad woman with a very bad mouth. She said, I was so embarrassed. Anyway, I have seen Mother Zaif. And I said to him, I really must apologize for my bad behavior back in 2001. And he said, yes, but you have changed, haven't you, mashallah. And, um, and he is um, very, you know, he was very supportive um, of me. And he is an incredible man because a few months after he had uh, announced that I was being released, he was approached by um, the Pakistan authorities and he was told, Your Excellency, you are no longer Your Excellency. And he was taken away and handed over to the Americans who took the ambassador and they stripped him, blindfolded him and beat him and abused him and took him to background and took him to Guantanamo and uh, and gave him the, um, the, the the terrible treatment that people are still today enduring in um, in Guantanamo. So quite often I'll say to people, thank God I was captured by the most evil, brutal regime in the world and not by the Americans. That's my story, my journey. I've probably talked much longer than I intended. But um, do we have time for any questions? Yes? So if anybody has any questions, please feel free to ask them. I'm going to sit down. And uh, thank you for being so attentive and too polite to say. <laughs> Enough. <laughs> thank you. Hi. Uh, I've read a lot about you, so thanks so much for coming here first. Uh, it's been great, especially to know about your uh, anti-war campaign uh, and stop the war coalition. Uh, but what I want to say is, uh, as a journalist, that uh, you've also got the experience of working for press TV here, you're even kind of uh, an English language funded channel. What are your views about the Iranian government? Well, <coughs> I have worked for press TV. And um, I don't know how many of you have watched Press TV. On the whole, um, it does an excellent job at what it's designed to do. But I left in March because 
of the um, way it is covering the situation in Syria um, in a very much uh, black and white way that Assad is a great guy and um, anybody who opposes him is a terrorist. Um, <coughs> so I've, I've left press TV now. I have been to Iran a few times and on the whole, of course, each time I've been there, it's been for a week or two weeks and then I've come back. Um, on the whole, I've been impressed by it. I'm not impressed with uh, some of the attitudes uh, and positions adopted by the government. Um, and I did say at the last women's conference that I was at uh, that uh, it was it was a conference on um, equal rights for women, and there were some men there who had some very um, I thought um, non-friendly attitudes towards women, and I was quite critical. I feel as though I've always been able to speak freely in Iran, but then again, I have never had to live there. So as a visitor, I do have a different idea. What I do see is that uh, more women than men are in the universities, and that I think that um, the political system is, uh, is slated against them, that they're not able to rise up as, uh, as easily as, as the men. Um, but... I mean, the thing is, uh, uh, like in 2009, there was a great election in Iran, and uh, the Iranian government, the uh, South versus the Iranian people, uh, very badly. I mean, it, so taking the Bahar and the, the spring uprisings in Arab countries, you see stuff in Iran about 2009. But it was suffers very badly, and press TV was again at that time. It was it, it did a lot of censorship in terms of well, showing the violation. So I quite like to see mm -hmm. how how your views on yeah, I'll on I'll give you them. Um, before the um, elections, I had been to um, Tehran, and uh, one of the things that I like to do um, is to try and get out and about, and I think that the the greatest sources of information are taxi drivers. Taxi drivers the world over tell you what's happening and uh, they're, a, they're a good source of information once they become trusted or they trust you. And um, as a result of, uh, and, and I've been into the south of, um, of Iran as well where the Arab population is. Um, and they don't like the people in, in Tehran at all and they'll stand up and, uh, on public platforms and, and they'll slag off the government, which is interesting. And uh, So when I got back, I was interviewed by CNN and they said, who is going to win the election? And I said, it'll be a landslide for Ahmed Dinajad. And they said, well, that isn't what we're getting. And I said, no, because you're speaking to the educated elite in North Tehran. And uh, they don't like Armington Chad, with their own reasons. But I said, he is loved by the peasant classes. And they are the ones who you don't speak to because you don't speak Farsi. And they don't know how to get a voice on CNN. And I said, so it will be a landslide. And, um, you know, it, it, uh, it will go to Ahmadinejad. When I got back to Press TV, there were various Iranians in there who said, how dare you say that? And I said, I can only speak what I felt. And, you know, I'm from the working classes in, the, in, in County Durham. And, uh, and I know the attitude of the English educated elite, who if they had their way, they wouldn't give the vote to the likes of me. And, um, and the people voted. And a large minority, a large minority, did not get the result they wanted. 
and they went out onto the streets in their tens of thousands and they demonstrated. And supporters of Ahmed and Najat went out in their hundreds of thousands and demonstrated. And the attitude which made me feel uncomfortable was that these peasants aren't intelligent enough to know what they're voting for anyway and they shouldn't have the vote. So that was largely my attitude. My last trip to Tehran, you can feel the dissent is still there and the resentment is still there because the sanctions are biting and it's affecting um, the wealthy, the elite, the educated. But don't, don't, don't you still think that people were suppressed after, uh, I mean, the, the, the demonstrations that happened after the election? But there were more. I mean, the, the, the it, was, it, it was like, say, Cameron getting elected and um, people in Manchester uh, demonstrating, he's not our choice and we didn't want him, this vote has been rigged, this election is rigged because we didn't want him, while the rest of the country say, no, shut up and get on with it. And that is, is, um, is my feeling. Um, what saddened me um, was the way I felt uh, the um, Masavi misled um, the Green revolt and, and didn't lead it um, from the front and seemed to be blowing it's hot in the cold. House virus, so it's been from the house virus and it's had a heart attack. And they haven't even... <laughs> but don't you believe that um, the majority of Iranians, not the elite, the English-speaking elite who have a voice in the West... But, but not really, I mean, I question Iranians... But I think we're getting away from the... Yeah. No, I mean, they Let's let's talk about this afterwards because I don't think anybody here has come to listen to Iranian politics. Ah uh, no, of course, yeah, but I mean it's supporting Bashar Assad in Syria and it has Jesus. Jesus. Brother, can we move on? Does anybody have any more questions? Well, brother, yes, sorry, sorry, I just wanted to. Um, uh, we'll to talk about it after. Yeah, yeah, sure, sure, yeah. Sorry. Yeah, I have to leave and miss your uh, best part of your fascinating story. Sorry. Uh, what have become the two guys? Any, any knowledge? Yes, yes, I've, um, I've met them uh, again. Uh, the two guides were um, also taken up to Kabul. And when I got back to the UK, I broadcast um, quite a bit on the, um, on the Afghan BBC service. Uh, <coughs> asking for leniency to the two men. I couldn't say that they were my guides because I had kept up this story that I didn't know these two men. I didn't know who they were. Um, but I did say, please show the same clemency that uh, you showed me. You released me on humanitarian grounds. Please release them. When the Taliban was routed from uh, Kabul, they drove the two guides down to Jalalabad and said it's every man for himself now and they let them go. And um, I returned in the February, uh, the next year, and I met uh, one of the guides, Jan Ali. Of course, I was still culturally ignorant of, uh, of, of things. And when I saw him in the hotel lobby, I went running to him and gave him a great big hug and he just froze on the spot. And um, people in, in Islamabad just stopped and looked as um, I'm hugging this man who was um, from the then called Northwest Frontier and looked, you know, this big strong Pashtun with a big beard and he just froze and was so horribly embarrassed that this very emotional Western woman had gone, oh, Jamali, and, uh, you know, and, um, so I, I won't do that again. <laughs> but um, I said to him, how did the Taliban treat you? And he said, um, they treated us uh, well. Um, and we heard that you pleaded for us. And uh, so, um, you know, we were released. And I said, are you angry with what happened? And he said, no, it was written. But he also... Um, was in contact later when I embraced Islam and they are delighted. How were they kept? They, uh, well, the 
Americans, I think, got in in the November. So um, they were they, they got out in the November. I was released on October the eighth. Yes. Salaam. Thank you for sharing your story. Uh, <coughs> it's really quite inspiring for those Muslims that you know born into Islam. It's obviously a brave thing to do to, to change your lifestyle you know, from Christianity to Islam. I just wanted to ask a question about the Taliban. Um, obviously, the Taliban has a long history, and initially it was used to fight against the Russians and then the Americans. But now in the media, we hear stories of um, more in Pakistan about you know suicide bombings and explosions where civilians are dying. And this the media are saying you know the Taliban uh, carried out these attacks. Um, so what must our view be on the Taliban, and how true are these stories? And what's the current uh, play with the Taliban? And um, how influential are they in the region? Are you following this story? Yes, I'm. I'm following. Um, I mean, the Taliban uh, weren't part of the Mujahideen, um, although many of them were Mujahideen. But the the um, the Taliban were formed in the mid '90s. And they were, I think many of you already know that it means student, and many of them, um, and, and they were religious students uh, based in Kandahar. And they only became active and, and in power when some incidents had happened involving um, the rape of some girls, and, and they were asked to intervene. And they, um, they intervened uh, with one warlord, I think, that they killed him for what he did, and his men turned around and then said, we will follow you. And, and um, to cut a long story short, they, they went through most of Afghanistan with the Quran in one hand, the sword in the other, and, and they brought about a stability that hadn't been there before. Um, some people appreciated it, some people didn't. But when I have, and I've been back to Afghanistan many times, and um, I, I remember speaking to a woman in Gardais, I don't go embedded, um, I've got my trusty burger, which <laughs> is brilliant, and, and I go in and nobody bothers me. Um, and I remember a, a, an Afghan woman in Gardais saying to me, um, I hated the Taliban, they killed two of my uncles. Now I hate the Americans, they killed 16 of my cousins. The maths are easy to work out. Um, again, similar to something that I was talking about before, you speak to the educated English-speaking elite and they hate the Taliban. You go out into the outlying areas of Afghanistan and um, they crave the security that they had before under the Taliban, men and women. And this other thing that uh, we're often told, along with the kite flying story, that uh, women are not allowed to be educated. When I returned, and if you work out at the, the war, there was 9-11, when the war started, um, on October the 8th, then uh, the Taliban were routed and out of Kabul and, and um, in February 2002, um, the university in Kabul opened for the first time after the war and entrance exams were held. So this is four months on after the Taliban. More girls than boys passed the entrance exam. Now then, how did that happen if the Taliban did not allow women to be educated? Is that what the Taliban didn't allow were Western charities going in, pushing their brand of education. Um, so we have to be careful with all the propaganda that comes out. Now the Pakistan Taliban, 
Where did they come from? I've never heard of them. They weren't there in 2001, 2002. You know, the, the, nobody had heard of the Pakistan Taliban. But, and, and this is something I'm um, just starting a PhD on, um, on uh, drone attacks. The Taliban was born um, in Pakistan I think it was 2003, 2004, it was a September anyway. And a drone came over into Waziristan and put some missiles into a house, killing 15 people, including women and children. And there was outrage in the area. And so the people of uh, Waziristan held a funeral the next day, as is the Muslim custom, and uh, about 15, 20,000 people turned up to that funeral, and another drone came and killed mourners in that funeral. And I was told that is when the Pakistan Taliban was born. Then you move to the present day and you get an atrocity like the shooting of young Malala. And that is so far removed from certainly the Taliban that I met and the Taliban that um, was created in Pakistan. And I don't think I have ever met a Muslim who says that women should not be educated. I, I really don't think I've ever come across a practicing Muslim who says that, um, who, I, I don't think I've ever met a father who doesn't want his daughter educated. I've just not encountered it. And I have traveled around the world. So this uh, Pakistan Taliban, I think that uh, there's probably about three or four different groups that are criminally motivated, um, that are um, that maybe are not as um, true, are holding on as tight to their Islam as say the original Taliban um, that from the 90s. It's very, very difficult. I mean, if um, and, and you ask people, and what I do know, though, from the early research that I've done so far on drone attacks, is that when you get an increase of drone attacks, you get an increase of suicide bombings. And last year, when um, Pakistan held Raymond Davis, the CIA man, the number of drone attacks was reduced dramatically because the Americans didn't want to inflame people against Raymond Davis while they were trying to get him out. And during that period of little or no drone attacks, there were little and no suicide attacks. So it's quite, quite interesting. Um, it's something that I think that I need to, to learn a lot more about it. I find it confusing. I mean, if there's anybody here who can explain the, um, who are the Pakistan Taliban, I just think it's two or three, four different uh, groups, but all with different motives as well. Um, but certainly, girls were educated um, under the uh, uh, under the Taliban. That is actually like that, sister. Uh, you you may remember, you know, you came to Sheffield once in two thousand and two. And my son Musa wasn't born at that time. <laughs> uh, and I did ask a question, and you know, uh, if I could just uh, this is you know going back in two thousand and one, when you were with Taliban and you had been released, uh, you're still in Afghanistan, but Mail published a four-letter kind of story of yours, 
uh, which uh, uh, in a way, you know, oh, it, it was, I would have thought that it would have been difficult because you are obviously still in captivity or, you know, you might have been released. So just from this perspective of how does the media work, you know, how did they manage to publish a story out when you were still there? And I think it was uh, uh, like, you know, it became very kind of, you know, covered by media, various other media outlets. Do you remember that? No, what, what was the story? I think it was your uh, story about your captivity. Oh, right. Well, with <coughs> when I was released, um, as I say, I was working as the chief reporter for the Sunday Express and uh, within a week um, of my, in fact it was within about three or four days of my release that um, uh, supplement was, um, was in the <coughs> Sunday Express and, it, uh, and they serialised it. And the publisher, Richard Desmond, um, made, I'm told, about two million pounds subsidizing, uh, serializing that story around the world. Because when I was released, um, I was grabbed by the he Express newspapers right. and uh, taken out of the country and uh, locked away in a hotel room until I had written about um, 20,000 words about what had happened to me and that um, so I spent about another week in the hands of Express newspapers um, and, and uh, but I don't um, I'm quite sort of uh, okay about that because when I was it is quite a funny anecdote when I was um, arrested by the Taliban and, and the news had filtered out, Richard Desmond said, I've got to go and, um, and get her. I'll have to go to uh, Afghanistan. And the editor, my editor said, you can't go to Afghanistan. And he said, why not? He said, there are three reasons. He said, why not? He said, you're Jewish, you're Jewish, you're Jewish. He said, okay, then we'll send him pointing at... Uh, one of his deputies, who was a tall man with a beard, he said, "Well, send Paul Ashford." And Paul Ashford went out to um, Islamabad with an Urdu-speaking uh, lawyer, uh, Salia Hussein Din, and they went straight to the Taliban embassy and said who they were, and they said, "We want to." Um, get Yvonne Ridley released. She is a bona fide journalist. And Richard Desmond had said to Paul Ashford, one million, two million, whatever it takes, just bring her back. And Paul Ashford ran Richard Desmond, who was a very hard-nosed businessman. And he said, Richard, um, I think we've got a, a problem here. And he said, why? And he said, I don't think um, getting out the checkbook is a good idea. And he said, oh my goodness, he said, how much do they want? And he said, they don't want money. And he said, well, what do they want? Do they want weapons? Do they want food? Is it medicine? You know, what do they want? And he said, they're not interested in money or making any money. He said, I'd heard these people were sick and twisted, but I didn't know how bad it was. So it was quite funny that, um, and this is something that um, the Americans didn't understand either, that you can't throw money um, and expect to get results. And dropping leaflets offering 50 million for Osama bin Laden is not going to work on people who don't even have a dollar a day. It's just such a big sum, it just didn't, you know, they're not interested in money.